Uh, today we're going to be talking about Madame Blavatsky, medium and magician. Uh, here we go. So, uh, you know, the history and beliefs uh, surrounding uh, Helena Petrona Blavatsky uh, is, is really steeped in, in mystery and controversy uh, and is perhaps, it is oddly expected in someone so widely regarded as one of the most important figures uh, in reviving Western esotericism, right, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, she, she combined uh, Greco-Roman philosophies like Hermeticism and, uh, and Neoplatonism with Eastern philosophies, right, uh, most notably Hinduism and Buddhism, right? Uh, she came from a wealthy Russian-German family in Ukraine. So she does come from Ukraine, which has quite a bit of relevance in, in right now. Uh, she's largely uh, self-educated. Uh, Blavatsky claimed to have traveled much of the world in, in search of wisdom. Uh, eventually, she will found the Theosophical Society in 1875 and published the famous work known as Isis Unveiled. 1877, although she was kind of upset with that title because just, just something you may not know, uh, she wanted the title to not to be uh, Isis Unveiled, but uh, the Unveiled Isis, but whatever. Okay, so anyway, moving right along, and um, uh, she is viewed as bringing uh, pre a synthesis of science and, and religion and philosophy all together. Uh, some people see her as a guru. Some people see her as a spiritual master. Some people say that she is a, a spiritualist or a charlatan. Uh, she's very, uh, she's very misunderstood. And so today I'm going to go through her life story and her ideas, and maybe we can give some context to it. Now, I, I do have to say that she does have some pretty interesting fans that that appreciated her over over the the years. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of Jack London or uh, Henry Miller or D.H. Lawrence or Jean Sibelius, right? Or Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison really liked her. Um, Lewis Carroll, Ian e. Foster, Carl Jung, Thornton Wilder. I think you get the point. <laughs> so she's had some very famous people uh, who really admired her, uh, in, in, you know, including, of course, um, um, you know, going going further, uh, uh, you're going to have Mahatma Gandhi uh, really admire her as well. So she does have lots of fans. Now let's go into some scholars. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring this scholar specifically up is his name is James Santucci, and he teaches at a wonderful school. Uh, it's called Cal State Fullerton, where I happen to teach also, and he teaches in a wonderful department, and that's some. Um, Religious studies department where I where I also teach, and um, uh, he he actually is a scholar that focuses much of his work on theosophical history. He has a lot of credibility, and he says this. He says all too often this subject, uh, referring to Theosophy and Blavatsky, when it is discussed in scholarly circles, is presented in a most unscholarly fashion. Falsehoods are perpetuated, and original research is not actively pursued. And I have to say that that is absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And the thing is, I'm going through these various sources, and, and I realize there's so much bias against her that starts all the way back in the 19th century. Uh, and in many cases, oh, some of these claims are unfounded, which we'll go into. Um, there's others that have, have, have said that, you know, that she is. A fraud. Uh, David Reigan, a uh, scholar of Sanskrit, says that uh, scholars have not uh, taken to Blavatsky seriously uh, because it is generally accepted that she was proven to be a fraud. There was therefore no reason or need to evaluate her writings. However, he continues that 1986 century old report, which is primarily responsible for branding her as a fraud was itself put in serious doubt. It turns out that the acclamation against her was also uh, much conjectured. So, and you have others like Ronald Hutton, who says that uh, 
Uh, she is the century's uh, truly international figures and considerably popular and so forth and so on. So scholars still know what to think about her, you know. But so who was Blavatsky? Well, Blavatsky, uh, she was uh, born as Helena uh, Petrovna von Hong. Uh, she was born in the Ukrainian town of Yekaterinburg which was then part of the uh, Russian Empire. And she was born on August 12th, 1831. Uh, and she was very quickly uh, baptized uh, into the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, the reason why is there happened to be a, a cholera epidemic at that time. And it was, it was really impacting her town pretty hard. So they wanted to make sure that she was baptized before she died. <laughs> but uh, Fortunately, very much so, she survived. Uh, she was uh, born uh, to her 17-year-old mother, uh, a certain Helena uh, Von Hohn, uh, who did also, unfortunately, catch cholera, but uh, she did survive. Her mother happened to come from royal stock. Uh, she was a daughter of, of Princess Helena Atona Dagobrukova. Love that name, right? <laughs> Who, like her daughter and granddaughter, was self-educated. Blavatsky's uh, father uh, was a certain uh, Peter uh, Alexandrovich von Hohn, who is a direct descendant of the German von Hohn family. Uh, they were also aristocratic stock. Uh, a, in fact, a direct uh, descendant of the of. Um, uh, of, of the German von Hohn family. Uh, he served in the Russian Royal House Artillery uh, and um, he held the rank of the rank of colonel. Uh, and when, when, when she was born, when little Helena was born, at this time, this may be hard to believe, but uh, Russia uh, was uh, attacking Poland. There was a Russian Polish war going on. Again, there's uh, interesting threads of commonality here, but uh, there it is. So she didn't see her father, who was serving with the Russians, until, well, until she was uh, six months old. Uh, so now what will happen is the father will return to the town and they will move. And eventually they end up in Odessa in 1835, uh, where Blavatsky's maternal grandfather uh, lived and working as a civil administrator. Uh, and here uh, in Odessa, Blavatsky's sister, Vera, was born. And why that's important is that her sister throughout the years writes about Blavatsky's life. That's one of our sources of information, especially during the so called dark periods where we don't know much about her. Now, now Blavatsky's mother, uh, what happens is they go from Odessa and they move to St. Petersburg. And uh, her mom uh, was, um, uh, she was a, a novelist. Yeah, she was a, a writer. And so she wrote uh, under different names uh, as a novelist. So you can see where, uh, where Helena gets her uh, literal uh, penchant right there to, to enjoy uh, various uh, reading, for example. But what I think is fascinating about uh, about the mom is that she was also a translator. Well, she's the one who translated uh, into the Russian language uh, from English uh, the works of Edward Bulwer Lytton. Now you're going, Edward Bulwer Lytton, well, who in the world is that? Okay, so we may not know his name, but we also know, but we do know uh, some of his. Uh, his famous uh, phrases. Uh, once I say this phrase, you'll know who exactly uh, who he is. The pen is mightier than the sword. <laughs> yeah, that's the guy that coined that word. Well, uh, she would have to translate that into Russian, right? Uh, he was the one who, who wrote the, the famous opening phrase that's oftentimes made fun of now. It was a dark and stormy night. Uh, he was the one who said that the uh, uh, the idea of per the pursuit of the almighty uh, dollar or the great unwashed and so forth. So a lot of cliches come from this man. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have it translated into Russian, but uh, uh, there you have it. Now, 
what will happen is, as you can imagine, Blavatsky's already moving from place to place. You know, this is the way her father's job was like, kind of a rootless kind of existence. And that may have influenced Blavatsky later on. All right, now we go somewhere. <clears throat> Around 1837, it turned out that um, uh, Fidel, uh, who was, of course, the grandfather, uh, was assigned to become a trustee for the Kalamak peoples of Central Asia. The Kalamak peoples of Central Asia. When he did so, uh, Blavatsky and her mother accompanied him to Astrakhan. Now, this is located right along the Volga River, uh, where they actually befriended uh, one of the leaders, the Kalmyk, uh, by the name of Tumen. Now, why, is, why am I bringing this up? This is, seems to be, well, this is the beginning of something. The Kalmyks, uh, they were Mongols that uh, originated from Western Mongolia. Uh, they came um, in 1724 uh, to, uh, they actually fell under Imperial Russia. The Kalamaks were practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism. I know. What are the chances <laughs> that she ends up amongst people uh, who are Buddhists <laughs> in Russia? <laughs> so there she is. Uh, this is uh, Blavatsky's first experience with the religion outside of Russian Orthodox. Now, while she's only six at this time, don't worry, because she'll return back during her teens. So this uh, during the summer, and so she. So this is this is not the end of this, but this is the beginning of this connection, of being curious about belief systems outside of her own. Uh, the Kalamics uh, practiced a kind of Buddhism uh, known as Gluk, as founded by Ji Tonskapa, uh, who lived from 1357 to 1419. Uh, by the way, his name means, uh, it sounds pretty cool, Ji Tonskapa, right? It actually translates as the man from Onion Valley. <laughs> so anyway, it was founded by uh, the man from Onion Valley. And uh, he was um, he had a Mongolian father and a Tibetan mother. And he claimed to be filled with the power of the three most wrathful deities of Tibetan Buddhism. So he's filled with this power. Uh, first of all, he's filled with the spirit of Aruka, uh, and then second, Hevacha, and finally, Yamataka. So these are known as the, the wisdom kings because they are very fierce, uh, but, uh, you know, very fierce, at least in, in, their, in their faces, so to speak. Uh, so, and then he himself thought he was the emanation of a bodhisattva. So there you have it. Uh, he thought he had a prajna of insight. He taught uh, that uh, there's nothing that has an existence of its own, but always comes into existence of independence of other things. And so since objects do not exist through their own name, they're only established as existing through the force of convention. So these are some of the early ideas that uh, the she's going to be encountering and will be encountering uh, to her early uh, teens. So Blavatsky, again, uh, is mixing with different perspectives. Now, what happens now is that uh, in 1838, when she was seven, Blavatsky's mother moved with her daughters, uh, with her husband, to Platova. Uh, here, she learned how to play the piano, and she got proper dance lessons. Well, well at least that's what they, you know, tried to do that. But I got to tell you, um, she was, Blavatsky was mischievous <laughs> as a child. Um, she uh, was described uh, as a, a wayward, invalid child. Uh, she was also understood as a, a quite a storyteller. She loved to tell stories. She loved to make things up and have people listen to her. She loved that attention. And she started that pretty early on, right? Uh, 
I kind of look down on her because uh, she liked to mix not with the wealthy kids, but with the poor kids, uh, those who are, you know, and they seem to have a natural, they, they seem to like her, seem to gravitate toward her. She was also uh, educated in French. She learned art. Uh, so that was, that was good. And then uh, she also learned uh, how, to, how to ride a horse. Where she wrote, learned to, to, to ride the horse is when she went back to Alame for the summer. Yeah, you remember I told you about those? You know, those you know, what happens is that she learned uh, horse riding while there when she was a teenager now uh, from the Calamics. And she did learn also some of the Thai, uh, Tibetan language. So again, she's being immersed in this other culture, which is a Buddhist culture. In fact, though, during this period of time, she discovered uh, that there was uh, the personal library of a maternal great-grandfather, a certain Prince Pavel, uh, and um, it contained all these books on esoteric subjects, and she was absolutely fascinated. Now, he was uh, into Freemasonry uh, in the 1770s. He belonged to what's called eventually the right of strict observance. Now, this right of strict observance uh, was, uh, was very German, and it wasn't the people in charge supposedly were these unknown superiors. Uh, he was initiate. But I do have to say it's kind of interesting because uh, they were actually on a mission, this particular right, uh, to reform much of these lodges from of all things, the occult sciences. So he's joining an order that seems to be against the occult sciences to kind of clean them up, so to speak. And yet, uh, when you look at his library, it's filled with abundance of books on just the very thing that he was supposedly fighting against. And you can imagine Blavatsky is loving this. Well, according to... Uh, the next step here is Blavatsky supposedly met at this time spirits. That's right. Spirits. One was of uh, Alessandro Cogligostro. Uh, and uh, this was a an Italian adventure and a and a self-styled magician. Uh, and he was he was known uh, for psychic healing and alchemy and scrying, right? And um, and the idea is, is that, is that, is that he is, he is present. Well, we'll talk more about this in a few moments. We'll go. He also met, she also met St. Germain, supposedly during this period of time. St. Germain, again, is a very controversial topic. Uh, they describe him as a courtier, a charlatan, a alchemist, a, a violinist. Uh, he composed music. Uh, he was he was very popular, right? Uh, and Blavatsky identifies him as one of the masters of ancient wisdom, and he is said to have all these powers and a very long life. There's a story. I feel like I'm Blavatsky. There's a story where it is said that um, Sir Francis Bacon actually faked his own death. Uh, this happened to be on Easter Sunday. Of April 9th, 1626, that he went to his own funeral and then he left uh, England and headed off to, to Transylvania, where he found a castle. And there, uh, by using alchemy, uh, he became, uh, went through his transformation and became Saint Germain one of the masters of ancient wisdom. And so uh, these are, by those who are theophysists, believe that uh, he is one who forms a spiritual hierarchy of the planet Earth. Uh, sometimes they're also known as the ascended masters, right? So St. Germain uh, was a manifestation of the resurrected form of Sir Francis Bacon. And so Blavatsky claims that 
during this period of time when uh, she is in Russia, she's visited by Saint Germain. Blavatsky also claims that she was visited by this mysterious Indian man, this mysterious, mysterious man from India. Later on, uh, she will say that she found out that this mysterious Indian man who visited her while in Russia in her teens was Master Morian, who she later on happened to uh, uh, encounter, she said, uh, in England. Now, speaking of England, uh, according to uh, her own accounts, uh, Blavatsky uh, was taken to England by her father. This is the first time she's making a, a major trip where she goes to London and she goes to Bath. However, a lot of people say that this may never have happened, that dad didn't take her to England and that she made this up. Well, we don't know for sure exactly what happened. Anyway, then she spent a year living with her aunt, and then she moved to Tiflis, Georgia. And there, uh, she had a friendship with a certain Alexander Glutzen, who was a Russian Freemason. You're, you're, are you seeing some connections here, right? Uh, she would then, at this point, claim that she, uh, in connection, would open up to many paranormal experiences, that she, uh, while she's in Georgia, uh, she practiced astral projection. Uh, and uh, also she saw the same mysterious man from India in her vision. When she turned 17, um, I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, there was a certain uh, Nikifor Blavatsky. Uh, he was in his 40s. Uh, he happened to be the vice governor of the Irvin province. And um, at 17, she decided that she's going to get married. She's going to marry him. Why would she marry him? Well, she kind of didn't know either. So and she said that, well, we were both into magic. And so that's what we had in common. Well, but then when it came time to get married, um, she wanted not to get married. And then when she was actually married, uh, she tried to flee and run away from him. So we don't know the full story, but we do know that eventually uh, she is about to be taken back to Odessa to her family and she flees. And she escapes and she goes to Constantinople. She goes to the Ottoman Empire. And for the next nine years, she travels the world. Uh, possibly this, uh, these travels were financed by her father. Now, Blavatsky did not, did not keep a diary during this time. And so, and she was not accompanied by anybody from her family. So many people say that we can't verify her activities. I'm going to say this. It's kind of yes and kind of no. Uh, the interesting part is, is that Blavatsky is such an exuberant kind of character and so controversial that she attracts so much attention. You just can't help it. Blavatsky, when she enters a room, people notice. And so as she's going from place to place, she, had, she attracted different kinds of travelers to travel with her. And these travelers, in turn, did give accounts. So we do have bits and pieces of accounts by people who encountered her along the way. Again, she's pretty hard to miss. <laughs> so uh, what happened is, is that uh, she... Well, she's in Constantinople. She develops a friendship with a Hungarian opera singer by the name of Agardi Metrovich. And um, she claimed that uh, she saved him from being murdered. In fact, she says in one account that she saved him from the gallows in Austria. Uh, and uh, he was kind of a, <clears throat> he was an interesting individual. He's not just an opera singer. He was an advocate for a united Italy. Italy at this time was, a, was still a kind of a scramble of different states, and the, the papacy wanted to keep it that way. But he wanted uh, uh, Italy to be united, uh, and he was very patriotic. Well, because of this, the Pope hated him right, and had him exiled at one point. There's another story where. Uh, there's going to be a, the 
there's a bunch of Maltese that were hired uh, by Catholic monks to try to kill him. So it's kind of always on the run. <laughs> so, so he runs into Blavatsky and they form a deep friendship and they do meet again. So we'll run into him again. Also, uh, while in Constantinople, she met the very beautiful Countess Sophia Keslakova. Uh, she was the wife of Pavel Keslakova, uh, who was a brilliant Russian reformer under Nicholas I. I mean, she's beautiful. We don't know a lot about her, but if you want to Google her name, uh, there are so many beautiful paintings of her you know, wearing with her hair and different curls and coils and lovely dresses, a very wealthy. A uh, very attractive woman. And uh, with her, with this very prominent person, Blavatsky toured Egypt and went with her to Greece as well as Eastern Europe. So there is, there is, there is somebody who is there who is quite noteworthy. Well, she goes uh, to Cairo and she meets an American art student by the name of Albert Rosen. Rosen excuse me. She meets Rosen a few times. And Rawson does leave accounts about Blavatsky. In fact, uh, what I find is interesting is Rawson is an author. She's a writer. Uh, she likes writing uh, travel stories. And Rawson was actually on her way to join the annual caravan heading for Mecca and was disguised as a Muslim pilgrim. So uh, what happened is... Uh, how do I say this? Albert Rawson uh, and, um, and Blavatsky got themselves in a little bit of, of experiments. Um, Blavatsky hadn't tried hashish before. And so, so Rawson and her were kind of hanging out and she tried hashish. And apparently uh, she absolutely loved it and would have it many times in the future. And we'll talk more about that uh, later. Also, uh, of course, she did say that this was a success, by the way, the experiment. Also, she visited the Coptic magician, Paulus Metamon. Uh, Paulus Metamon, now we're kind of, this is, now we're getting into something a little, little odd uh, and controversial. Paulus Metamon was supposedly connected to the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. Supposedly connected to the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. What is the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light? Well, it's called a Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. It's also called a Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. And Levatsky's well, claiming that he, you know, that this person is a part of this. In 1851. And according to sources that we know, uh, this brotherhood uh, did not fully exist until 1870 or 18, to 18, you know, 1870, 1894. Others say that, well, wait a minute. Um, there could have been earlier, an earlier background to the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light that goes back to 1851. So, and then there's another story. That this is again, this, these are all these stories in the 19th century that the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light practiced something called sex magic, uh, which is taught by the American occultist by the name of Hostel Beverly Randall, uh, who lived from 1825 to 1875. I, this could be conjecture, who knows? But so uh, they practice this in, as, as their form of magic. And the claim is that the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. Uh, goes back to an earlier uh, group called the Fratis Lucas that was founded by Ecker von Eckhofen from the late 1700s. And then this goes back to what's called the German Order of the Golden and Rosy Cross that was founded in the 1750s. Now, why am I doing this? Well, because what happens is this. If I go forward, let's go forward now. Uh, for the German Order, the Golden and Rosy Cross, 1750s, Cutters Lucas, the late 1700s, and then you have this Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, uh, you know, whether 1851 or 1870. Well, this connects to another group called the OTO, 
I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard of the Ordo Templi Orientis that is formed by uh, Carl Kilner. But anyway, uh, they make that claim uh, that this is part, uh, that, that their background is connected to the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, one of the many streams that goes into the OTO. And of course, Kilner uh, founds the OTO, some say, say 1895, although the first manifestation is 1904. And um, along with another person by the name of Theodore Roos, and when Kilner dies in 1905, Roos takes over, and Roos meets a person by the name of Aleister Crowley. <laughs> and Aleister Crowley then uh, joins the group in 1910, is admitted into the OTO, writes the Gnostic Mass in 1913. I think you kind of know why I did that, right? So, so Blavatsky is starting to connect with these other orders and fraternities that will have a significant influence uh, in Western esotericism. So this is kind of where it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, so she met him. She spent some time with him as well. And uh, I'm not sure if there was any the sex magic stuff. In fact, the funny thing is, is that others claim that the idea of the sex magic uh, came into the inner video video. I, like I said, when we do these mysterious fraternities, it gets in the area of conjecture, and, um, and it's meant to be that way. It's meant to be mysterious. Uh, Alistair Crawley, though, does pay a lot of attention later on to Blavatsky's career, and a lot of the ideas that are brought up by Blavatsky goes right into Alistair Crawley. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so this is the beginning of, of many different ideas. She really does start so much. Okay, so she leaves Egypt and she goes to Paris and she encounters somebody who is a mesmerist uh, named Victor Michael, who is very impressed by her. And so she now investigates psychic research and hypnotism. Some people say, again, this is hearsay, that she's intentionally learning the art of hypnotism in order to mesmerize people into believing certain things or whatever, maybe have power of the mind. But anyway, hypnotize her with her mind, so to speak. He encouraged her as uh, to be a great medium, you know, so uh, uh, not a medium rare, uh, medium well done. So there it is. And um, did, did I say that out loud? I don't know. Uh, but uh, so he was very important for her spiritual development. Now, he was into something that is called mesmerism. Now, mesmerism was founded by Franz Mesmer in the 18th century. Uh, basically, Mesmer believed in these uh, invisible uh, natural forces. He calls them Lebensmaximus, uh, and that these invisible natural forces uh, are possesses all living things, like humans, plants, animals. These natural energies... Uh, are able to transfer from that which is animated with life to inanimate objects. And, and of course, this connects to the idea of what's called animal magnetism, right? So, so those who have a higher degree of animal magnetism, a higher degree of these invisible natural forces can cure illnesses. You know, of course, illnesses are, are caused by obstacles that get in the way of these thousands of these channels that move through your body, these energy channels. And so a uh, contact with somebody that has more of this energy uh, acts as a conductor and supposedly unlocks them. So this was used uh, for healing. If you want to unblock uh, something, you know, so you have echoes of ideas here, right? You know, it's almost the idea of the unblock I'm blocking chakras from one perspective, or uh, I'm blocking uh, different parts uh, of, of the body system as understood uh, by the Greeks and the Romans. So there you have it. Okay, so she's getting into this. You notice she's just kind of, she's taking from this, taking from that. She's listening to all of these traditions. But let's keep going. Oh, by the way, we talk about this is the beginning talk about reincarnation too and that perked her interest so although he you know he thought victor michael 
the thought that she may have a split personality. Oh, there we go. From there, she decided to visit uh, England. And here, she supposedly met that mysterious Indian that she had seen in her visions when she was in Russia and, of course, in Georgia. Um, who is this? But he suddenly appeared, and he was in physical form. He wasn't just a vision. He was real. And he named, and she, and she named him Master Moria, M-O-R-Y-A, Master Moria. She maintained that uh, he had a special mission for her. She must journey to Tibet. He claimed that Master Moria was one of the masters of ancient wisdom, right? And in fact, uh, later on, uh, it was Moria and another ascended master by the name of Kutumi, uh, who are uh, accredited for influencing her into founding the Theosophical Society. Now, they're part of Master Moria and another named Kut Humi. Uh, it's K-O-O-T, Humi, H-O-O-M-I, belonged, according to Blavatsky, uh, to a group of highly developed humans that are known as the Great White Brotherhood. The Great White Brotherhood. So they are the masters of ancient wisdom, and they are the great white brotherhood. Who are they? Well, great, bright, great uh, white brotherhood is a term that she uses first. She's the first to use the term the great white brotherhood. Uh, they are supernatural beings. They have great power. Uh, and what they do is they, they see those who are capable of enlightenment. And they arrive in physical form to visit those people, to give them a message and to teach them and to illuminate them. Okay, so Levatsky, uh, um, uh, you know, is apparently one of these individuals. Now, you know, there's another person that really got into the Great White Brotherhood and developed this, I this idea further. And he got it from her, and his name is Alistair Crowley. <laughs> so, once again, Alistair Crowley is is paying attention uh, to Blavatsky's career. Obviously, you know, he's way younger <laughs> of existing at this point, uh, but uh, he does take notes. Uh, and this is another example. Now, even though she's the first to coin this term, it doesn't mean that it's an original idea. It does go back a little ways uh, to a guy by the name of Carl Eckhardthausen. Uh, and he writes about this, the cloud, uh, within his book called The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary. And he talks about that there's this body of mystics who remain active after their physical deaths on earth. And they call themselves the Council of Life. The Council of Light, maybe Council of Life too. Council of Life. And so, of course, the Great White Brotherhood comes from this idea of the Council of Light. Uh, he's also said uh, that uh, uh, they had these powers of reaching those who need to have special knowledge and, and so forth and so on. Uh, by the way, he got his ideas uh, earlier on from what's called the Communion of the Saints, as well as ideas connected to the Rosicrucians and the Illuminati. So all these threads are coming together. But she's uh, she has this, uh, she's now met uh, one of them, and she'll meet another one soon, of these ancient masters from this Council of Light, from the Great White Brotherhood. Okay, so now, as far as Master Moria, you know, his personality is depicted in various ways, uh, but uh, they say that uh, he was a very gentle uh, man. Uh, he was logical, easygoing. Uh, taking endless pains to make things clear. Uh, it is claimed that where he lived in actuality was Tibet. So he did live in Tibet, according to her beliefs. And he lived near uh, another another uh, uh, master, another, uh, another from the Great White Brotherhood, 
and his name is Kut Huvi. The two are described as living near each other in Tibet with a Buddhist uh, monastery, uh, sorry, a, a Buddhist temple between them with a little pagoda standing there. Okay, so so there you have it. So now she's supposed to go uh, eventually uh, to Tibet. And that becomes a possible goal for her. But but she decided to make her way to Asia via the Americas. So she headed uh, on the way to Canada in 1851. Oh, no, she heads to Canada. Hey, Canadians, right? Well, uh, here, because uh, she was inspired by the novels of James uh, Cooper, uh, who wrote about the Native American communities in Quebec. So she wants to go and meet the Native Americans living there. She wants to uh, learn about shamanism and their ways of life. But unfortunately, she was wrong when she got there uh, by somebody from the tribe. Uh, she said that the behavior had nothing really to do with them, but it was the influence of Christian missionaries. She then headed south. And where does she go? She goes to New Orleans, right? She wants to investigate spiritual beliefs in New Orleans. And hey, that is a good place to go. I mean, you can see, of course, that you'll have the voodoo and a voodoo there. And then she goes to Texas. I'm not sure what she did in Texas. <laughs> Who knows? But she got to Texas. And then she went to Mexico, according to the story. You know, again, how much evidence there is of this, I don't know, right? And she got as far supposedly as the Andes before she went off uh, to the West Indies, Ceylon. Okay, from there, uh, she finally got to India. When she got to India, uh, according to herself, uh, she spent two years in India, and she supposedly found instructions from various letters that Moria had sent her. Uh, so she attempted to enter Tibet, but um, she was unsuccessful. And that's 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 kind of re realistic. You know? The British administration did not let her go. You know, they didn't want her to go at all. So she she later claimed that she headed back to Europe by ship. Uh, she said that she survived a shipwreck on the Cape of Good Hope, and then she arrived in England in 1854. But when she arrived in England in 1854, she faced a lot of hostility. And the reason why is at that time, there was the Crimean War going on in Russia, in the Ukrainian region. And so this war was between Britain and Russia. And because she was uh, of, of Russian and German, but specifically Russian background, uh, she was looked down upon and not treated very well. Well, she claimed that when she was there, uh, she worked uh, as a concert musician for the Royal Philharmonic uh, Society. We don't know. I don't know. I mean, we haven't found any evidence for that. Is it possible? Maybe. But she did run into Albert Rawson again. Remember Albert Rawson? She, you know, when they're doing hashish back in, in Cairo? Well, <laughs> they met again. Yeah, they met again. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, she went from there. Uh, she went to Chicago, Salt Lake City, and San Francisco. And then she went back to India again. <laughs> back to India. This time, uh, she went to Kashmir. Uh, and then uh, went to Burma. And then she made a second attempt to enter Tibet. She really wants to go to Tibet. She claimed that this time that she actually made it there. Uh, that she, she somehow got there through Kashmir. Uh, who took her there? Uh, she says a Tartar shaman. Uh, this Tartar shaman was wanting to go to Siberia. And, uh, and since she was a Russian citizen, maybe that would be useful for her, for him, to go through that way. Anyway, so uh, they, they reached uh, Tibet. They got to Ley, but then they got lost. And, you know, and that's from there. So they got into to Tibet, but they, did, they got lost. And she had to return. But they kind of got there, right? Maybe. Although a lot of scholars say that she did get there. So, you know, but she was there uh, in India from 1855 to 1856. Then she, guess what, went back to France and Germany. This lady travels, you know. Now, again, even if we don't believe her words, if we take those who saw her on the travels, 
a lot of these you know, are still all over the place and she is still traveling everywhere, right? So eventually she returned back to her family. Um, and, um, and then of course, uh, in, in 1860, she visited her sister uh, and, and then um, she ran into the Hungarian opera singer again, Merocevich, and she reconciled with her husband. Well, I know this is a surprise. She and her husband decided we're going to work on this thing. But uh, they adopted a son by the name of Yuri. But unfortunately, a few things happened. A few disasters happened. You know, she's returning to family life. She's returning to her husband. She's returning to her sister, her maternal grandmother. It looks like she is, you know, the, the prodigal daughter has come back. And they adopt a child by the name of Yuri. And then what happens is that she was riding on a horse and she fell and it knocked her out. Uh, and it was a spinal fracture and she went into a coma. Yeah, in a coma for quite a few months. She did recover uh, in Tilfus, Georgia. Uh, she claimed that this fall had reawakened her. Her, not, not only uh, reawakened her spiritual abilities, made it fully aware as a result of this uh, encounter. But, um, but later on, way towards the end of her life, uh, many claimed that some of her health problems and bodily pro problems were a result of this coma and this fall at this time, that it gave her a certain weakness. Well, then, of course, the real sad part uh, is is that well, her um, uh, their their adopted son died, you know Yuri, and that was pretty upsetting, obviously. So she did she did have a few travels uh, during this time. She went to Italy, Transylvania, and Serbia. She did study the Kabbalah. You know she studied the Kabbalah now, right? So into the Jewish mysticism. Wow, I mean, what a lady! But after her son died. That pretty well. That pretty well ended uh, whatever relationship she had with her husband. I mean, that's you know, first the, the coma, and then of course the son dying. Just pretty tragic. And so, 1867, uh, she went to the Balkans, she went to Hungary, and then back to Italy, where she claimed that she was injured fighting uh, next uh, fighting for uh, Garibaldi at the Battle of Mentana. Uh, this is the great battle. This has to do with Italian independence because Italian independence was very near and dear to her heart, uh, probably because of you know the the, the Hungarian right. <laughs> so, uh, what happens after that uh, is that then she claimed to obtain a message from Moria to travel back to go come back come back and let's let's go to Tibet. So she goes to Constantinople. Um, and then what happens is supposedly Moria in person met her there, and then they traveled together overland to Tibet. They go through Turkey, they go through Persia, they go through Afghanistan, then to India, and finally uh, enter Tibet uh, uh, via Kashmir. And here they stay with Master Kudhumi, or I should say she stays, because he lives his own place down the way, right? Uh, so there you have it. So now she's finally in Tibet, at least according uh, to the story. You know, this is according to the belief. And once again, I know you're looking at me like, how can they be physical and yet they're spiritual? And how can this work? And I'm going to explain this briefly because I did promise about this now that we have the gang together because these, these two spiritual ascended masters are very important. So in, in Buddhism, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, you have a concept uh, known as the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva. What happens here is is that is that in Buddhism you go through what's called samsara, which is also the same in Hinduism, where you are born, you live your life, you die, and there's rebirth. You know, and you're born, you live your life, die, rebirth. It goes on and on, and then of course eventually, you know, in Hinduism it's moksha. Uh, in uh, Buddhism, it's nirvana. Of course, you could go the other direction too. But, you know, we're not talking about that. What happens though is that when it comes time for nirvana, 
you are, you know, you have gained all this spiritual knowledge. You are ready to cross the other side. What happens is that you make a choice to stay on this side to teach others how to be liberated into nirvana. Because Mahayana Buddhism uh, focuses on an idea called karuna. Karuna is compassion. So that compassion makes them want to stay and to lead others to nirvana. Well, according to certain beliefs, uh, variations, uh, you know, I mean, they, they live their lives here uh, in a physical form. Uh, but uh, Blavatsky kind of builds on this. And so for, for her, what happens is that these spiritual masters, they are bodhisattvas, they're about to cross to the other side, they decide to stay in this life. But as they stay in this life, their life, because of their energies, are lengthened, and they live for centuries in some cases. Does that make sense? So, so they're embodied. But they're still ascended masters, and they decide that rather than be in spiritual form, they will use karuna and will submit even further to compassion for others, and they will go. All right, I'll even take a physical body. So does that, yeah, he's got it. So these are spiritual masters, uh, and, and and so so she hangs around them. Now you understand, right? She hangs around them, and uh, they have. Uh, they are practitioners of what's called a uh, Gluksa sect of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, during this period of time, he learned so much. Accordingly, he learned a language known as Senzar. Uh, Senzar, she claimed to learn this in Tibet. Uh, this is like an ancient language that, um, that according to she, uh, she said, that she learned this language and she learned uh, how to read a number of ancient texts that happened to be in this monastery. Uh, she said, this is what she says, she says, Senzar is a tongue absent from the nomenclature of languages and dialects with which Philogy is acquainted, she says. So she claims that this is a language that has no connection to any of her languages today. No connections. In fact, she goes further and she says that this language may be the language of those of Atlantis, and that the book of the Zan, which she said said to translate later on, uh, is this mystery speech. It is of this language. Uh, but uh, again, there's been we haven't seen this language. We haven't found her sources. It is claimed also that uh, Akut Humi. Right, uh, the one spiritual master and the other, of course, Mori, helped her develop her psychic powers. Uh, the masters they had all these amazing abilities. They had clairvoyance, clairaudience, right? Uh, they're able uh, to read people's minds, right? So tele telepathy. Uh, they're able to uh, to materialize, dematerialize. So they could appear from place to place. Uh, they can project their astral bodies. Uh, they can move objects. I mean, they are like Jedi knights. <laughs> so, so think of think of uh, so much. Think of the Jedi uh, from Star Wars, and you got the idea. This is what it's what what they're supposed to be able to do. All right. So now uh, again, there's many doubts about her going uh, to Tibet, but I will address this. First of all, they'll say there's no way she can get to Tibet because it is closed to Europeans. And um, it was. Second of all, it was extremely dangerous. There's all these bandits that are along the way. And I, I get that too. Third, she's very unathletic. You know, how could she have the energy, you know, to even get up? But there's a few other things that say that maybe she did. Uh, for example, um, uh, she was accompanied by Mor supposedly Moria. But let's just say she's accompanied by somebody who is from the local area. Lo people from local areas were allowed in Tibet. Maybe she did travel with them, and she said she did, into Tibet, and she was disguised uh, as one of, one of them. You know, she maybe had her head covered and got in there. The other thing that kind of tips off many scholars, like uh, D.T. Uh, Suzuki, uh, who's a well-known scholar of Buddhism, 
takes a look at her form of Mahayana Buddhism, and she goes through this, and she says, you know what, the kind of, the kind of Mahayana Buddhism she, that she knows about in depth happens to be Tibetan, for Tibetan Buddhism, but some of the inner mysteries that most Westerners did not know. So how in the world did she get these, these ideas? I have no idea. Maybe, although Blavatsky herself said that she was not allowed into the Buddhist temple or the monastery. I should say, not allowed the Buddhist monastery, I should say, not the temple. Not the, temple. Um, the, the point of the matter is, is that she could have gained some kind of knowledge. Also, the other part is, is that some of her descriptions of places are pretty exact for somebody that uh, hadn't been there, but maybe she heard it from somebody else. So, so people are on the fence of this one. Anyway, Blavatsky uh, says that she gained the evidence that she needed to to know that the spiritualist movement, which was really popular in the 19th century, had some valid claims. And so she went uh, or left Tibet to spread the good news that spiritualism may be true after all. So as she travels back, uh, she goes to Greece, uh, and here she meets another ascended master by the name of Master Hilarion. Master Hilarion, supposedly at one time in a past life, was the Apostle Paul of Tarsus, and later on was the Neoplatonist philosopher by the name of Iamblichus. Uh, some believe that uh, that um, you know that maybe he was also the Christian saint Hilarion, which is kind of strange because those lifespans between Iamblichus and Hilarion at the same time. Others say, well. Oh, uh, you can do that. You can live two lifetimes at the same time. There's no reason for that. So anyway, so anyway, so what happens there uh, is that there's communication between them. When Blavatsky goes uh, to Egypt, and she claims that um, she was aboard the SS Unoma, but on July 1871, it exploded during the journey, and the Blavatsky was one of the one out of survive one out of 16 survivors. She reaches Cairo, and when she reaches Cairo, she meets up with Metamon, who we mentioned before. Remember Metamon, right? So, so we're, and, and others. So she we're back uh, to what we talked about earlier, uh, having connections uh, with this uh, particular group uh, that will later have supposed connections to OTO. So she's hanging around them, as well as a certain Emmy. Emma Cutting. Uh, in fact, they form a group called Spiritism. Blavatsky actually forms this group. It lasts for two weeks, and Blavatsky closes it down because a lot of those who were working for her were not real mediums. They didn't have any psychic abilities. They're a bunch of charlatans. And so she herself ended that connection. Okay, then in Cairo, uh, she also met. Uh, with uh, another ascended master by the name of Serapis Bay. So this is the fourth one that she meets. And um, and so there you have it. Another, so, so, she, so far she has met four ascended masters in human form. She then met Lydia uh, Pashkova, who was a writer by trade. And now we have writings by her where she's visiting Syria, uh, she's going to Palestine and Lebanon, and we know this because we have somebody else who's writing about this. Well, that's at this time studies the mysterious beliefs of the Druze in the Lebanon area. Then she goes uh, to Bucharest and Paris, and finally Moria says, go to the United States. And so she arrives in New York City. In New York City, uh, she lives in a women's housing cooperative on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Uh, she is doing, a, she does leather work. Uh, she also designs advertising cards to, to make sustenance. Uh, during this time, she meets a certain Miss Elizabeth Holt who was staying there. And from here, we get a description, a very early description of Blavatsky. And I'm gonna read uh, this description, okay? so. She says, this is what Miss Elizabeth Holt says of Blavatsky at this time. Again, it's 1873. 
It says, but Madame Blavatsky sat in the office a large part of her time, but she seldom sat alone. She was like a magnet, powerful enough to draw around her everyone who could possibly come. I saw her day by day, sitting there rolling her cigarettes and smoking insensibly. She had a conspicuous tobacco pouch, the head of some fur-bearing animal, which she wore around her neck. So she has a pouch with some animal head on around her neck. Uh, she was certainly an unusual figure. I think she must have been taller than she looked. She was so broad, and she had a broad face and broad shoulders. Her hair was lightish brown and crinkled. Her whole appearance conveyed the idea of power. Now, now she wrote this account uh, about 50 years later. Uh, so she actually compares her to when a person meets Stalin. <laughs> and I don't think that's, you know, it's like meeting Stalin. Because Stalin was you know, around 50 years later. Uh, that's not a good thing. Anyway, moving around the song. Okay, so uh, Blavatsky, they weren't sure if she was an aristocrat or a Russian. But she's just simply a down on her luck. Uh, one time, there was this lady that was attacked by a man in the streets. And she comes running in. And it's interesting because Blavatsky says that, well, you know what you do to men who do this kind of thing? And she takes out a knife under the fold of her dress and said that she had it for any man who tries to molest her. It was her tobacco cutting knife. So apparently she was fierce and she was ready for anything. And I can imagine if she's traveling all these places that Blavatsky would have been very vulnerable. And but she's certainly feisty enough, and I'm sure she may have fought back and attacked men who had tried to do something like this. Now, uh, what happened is is that uh, uh, accordingly that uh, there's more that she wrote about. Holt wrote about that she liked talking about spiritual topics, and she liked talking about what are called deki. Uh, these are elementals who are tricksy little beings. Uh, she also enjoyed talking about reincarnation and past lives and so forth. Uh, so there you have it. Now, Blavatsky then moved uh, to a home for working women in another place where she gets interviewed by a journalist by the name of Anna Ballard of the New York newspaper, The Sun. And uh, they asked her lots of questions. So now she's becoming an object of curiosity. Uh, the story that they like to hear was uh, when she talked about her adventures in India, uh, they wanted to hear about the gruesome rope trick. Gruesome rope trick? Yeah, okay. So the gruesome rope uh, trick that uh, Blavatsky describes to this writer goes as follows. It's, it, he grasps one end of a ball of cord in his hand. Then a juggler threw up the ball, which went out of sight, then swiftly climbed the vertical cord until he too is out of sight. So basically, you know, uh, the, you got this cord, he climbs up this cord because he's going to catch this ball and they both disappear into the sky out of sight. Then all of a sudden, right, then all of a sudden, body pieces fall and they were placed in the basket. Finally, the basket was upturned and the man was brought back together again. <laughs> so there you have it. You know, it's like, so, you know, he goes, you know, he goes up this rope, they throw the ball up, he goes up, he disappears, body pieces fall down, they're put into a basket, and then open the basket, and he's one man again. So that was one of the stories that fascinated the, the son. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, okay. So what happens then is you have more descriptions of her. A certain Hannah Shepherd Wolf, when she moved to the women's home on Elizabeth Street. Uh, describes her that uh, so I saw half sitting, half reclining on a carpetless floor, a scantily clad, and then thought very unprepossessing woman who was introduced as Madame Lebatsky. She was stout, though not unwieldy. Uh, her eyes were magnetic and peculiar with a strange fascination in their blue-gray depths, but were in a sense beautiful. She also talked about the wooly texture of her light-colored hair, right? And uh, uh, also, she smoked sometimes as much as a pound's weight of tobacco a day. 
<laughs> so, uh, so she's she's a she's a constant smoker, right? Well, next uh, she moves out of there, and she moves in with the French widow. <laughs> so, uh, and there she keeps talking about the uh, according to the widow, uh, she talks about these Nike again, these these bin like creatures, these tricksters. Uh, there's one story where she's staying with this French widow, widow, uh, where she uh, they're, they're serving breakfast down downstairs. And she's not coming. And she's crying for help. And according to the story, uh, these little sprites, these little gin-like, trickster-like creatures had sewn her to the bed. <laughs> and according to the story, uh, uh, she could not have sewn herself into the bed in this way. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of Oliver's travels, right? So that happens. Then... Some good thing, good news. Well, maybe not good news, but uh, she re received news of her father's death. That's that's not the good news. But dad was rich, and dad left her a fortune. Now they said that she was spending money like crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, and um, I, oh, Mrs. Wolf says I soon learned that she was addicted to the use of hashish. She several times endeavored to persuade me to try the effects upon myself. She said she had smoked opium, seen its visions and dreams, but that the beatitude enjoyed in the use of hashish were heaven as to hell. She said that she found nothing to compare with its effects in arousing and stimulating the imagination. So she's, I guess she's uh, using a lot of hashish with her <laughs> newfound money uh, from dad. Uh, in December of 1874, uh, she met a Georgian, Mikhail Petanli, and uh, um, was, uh, uh, well, they became infatuated. And they got married. But that's kind of bigamy because she's already married, but she got divorced. So it wasn't bigamy for long. <laughs> no, you just can't make this apart. Well, that's me was uh, intrigued by a story. Of a of a, two boys, a William and Horatio Eddy. Now, these brothers were in Chittenden, Vermont, uh, who could claim that they could levitate and they could manifest various spiritual phenomena. Well, there was another person, this is important to the story. There's another person that was interested in these same two boys. His name was Henry Steele Olcott. Olcott also known as the Colonel. These two will be inseparable for much of the rest of her career. These are the two that become involved in founding philosophy. So this is the beginning of a wonderful uh, friendship. So Henry Steele Olcott, uh, he was known as the Colonel. Uh, he was uh, the agricultural correspondent for the New York Tribune for a while. And then during the Civil War, he became the special commissioner of the War Department in New York and then became a colonel and transferred to the Department of the Navy in Washington, D.C. Uh, by the way, you may recognize his name as Henry Steele Olcott was one of those who investigated the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865. So he was part of that. After that, after the war, uh, he became a lawyer uh, who specialized in insurance, revenue, and fraud. <laughs> so, so, so what will happen is he checks out these brothers first, and then later on, well, that's he will. So let's talk about these brothers. So the story goes is there's a certain um, a Zephaniah Eddy. He's a farmer, and he marries... Uh, a girl of Scots descendant by the name of Julia. And uh, they get a farm in uh, Chittenden. Uh, Julia, uh, he, she was gifted. She had the gift of clairvoyance, but she could also see ghosts. Now, she said, of course, this is a family trait because, well, her great, great, great grandmother was actually hanged as a witch. So this kind of goes with the family. Well, she married Zephaniah, and Zephaniah didn't want to talk about these matters. He's, he doesn't believe in this stuff, or I should just say, he doesn't believe in it, but it, 
stuff unless it's too real. And then if it's too real, then it's the devil. So that's kind of his mentality. So he encourages her not to use her spiritual gifts. They have their first child. The first child doesn't have any gifts. He's like, you know, since he doesn't run in the family after all. Well, <laughs> the next two kids come along, uh, brothers, and they both have this supposed gift. Uh, and, uh, and according to the story is that when they're sleeping at night, their little bodies will lift gently and float through the air by some, some power, right? Uh, they tried to go to school, but what happened the whole time is that there was supernatural occurrences in school that distracted the other kids. There was rapping sounds and things flying and so forth. And so, well, that's not working. So they, they pulled these, uh, the, the two uh, brothers out of school. There's one pretty scary story that goes on that one night Horatio, that's one of the brothers, when he's four years old, uh, he saw this creature covered with white fur. And then what happened is that uh, he saw it. And then the other children uh, saw this, whatever this is, and it became a luminous cloud. And then it turned uh, into some human form before it disappeared. Ooh, okay. Well, okay. So now lots of things are going on. And what happens is Zephaniah believes that the devil he tries to stop it, and he can't stop it. So, I don't know. This is kind of funny. He goes, well, if it's uh, if I can't stop it, then I might as well make some money off of it. huh?" So what he does is he decides to exploit it and put his two sons, use them for entertainment. And so he creates his own circle room with a balustrade along it. And they are able to do supposedly all these kinds of acts and tricks and conjure these things up. And so what happens is the colonel goes and he visits this. He sees what they're doing. Of course, the lights are extremely dim. And there's a murky lamp. Uh, and, uh, and supposedly, uh, uh, according to the story, is that um, uh, you're going to have 25 people all at one time. Uh, while he was when he was there, the spirit from a American Indian woman appears, by the name of Honto, and then what she does is that she has this knitted uh, shawl, and then, then she throws it over the balustrade and it becomes manifest so uh, people can see it. But uh, at first he looks at it, he's like, is that is that a, is that an Indian, or is that just somebody wearing an Indian dress? He also noticed that sometimes the voice sounded falsetto. He also saw uh, there was a manifestation of the spirit of Bright Star. Uh, and um, at the same time, he wasn't so sure about that. There's a spirit also of Chief Santa of the Winnebago. He appears, according to the story. Uh, also the spirit of William Reynolds, who just had died. He appears dressed in black with his full beard. Even his brother appears as well as William Brown, uh, another man of New York. What, what happens is, is that uh, uh, at uh, William Eddy's request, that's the other brother's name, he asked a, a lady in the audience who's a German music teacher, uh, her, you know, uh, that uh, asked, asked them to play the flute. Okay, so I'm sorry, I should him, a, 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 a male uh, 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 music teacher. He's a German music teacher by the name of Max Lenzberg. And so what happens is that, you know, he, you know, so he goes ahead, and he, you know, he, he plays the flute. And then what happens is that um, suddenly uh, there is what appears uh, is um, the, uh, uh, these two, these two, two spirits of little ones and Mrs. Lenzberg sees them and identifies them as her her daughters and uh so you know so and they she asks are you my daughters that have passed on and they rap uh and uh and so forth and of course then again you know there we go so this is looked at as proof this is looked at as evidence well Levinsky decided uh that she's going to visit Chittenden visit the circle on October 1874 uh and um and meets the colonel there who's investigating this. 
So they go there. And um, and so, yeah, uh, what happens is, is that the, they, they start to get to know each other, you know. And so what happens then is that the, a long and a short of it is, is that they decide that uh, they, they, want to, they want to pair up. They have the same sort of, of interests, uh, same commonalities. So there was uh, a um, uh, there was a meeting. Um, let's see here. It is. I'm sorry, my, my notes are falling apart here. Just give me a few seconds here. Okay. So what happens is is that two become friends and they develop names for one another. Alcott is called Maloney, and she wants to be called Jack. I don't know why she wants to be called Jack, and she instructs Alcott on her uh, belief system and. Tells him he needs to be celibate and teetotaling, uh, and also tells him that he needs to become a vegetarian. The funny thing is, she never became a vegetarian, but he wanted she wanted him to become a vegetarian. So there. Uh, they also visited other uh, mediums and were kind of touring about uh, for a while. Then what happens is that while in New York, Levatsky runs into once again Rawson one more time. You know, we remember them, and uh, and uh, what happens is once more, uh, she is uh, she is all talking about hashish. Apparently, this is his, this is this is her hashish body, buddy. So they hang out together, and she says hashish multiplies one's life a thousandfold, and so forth and so on. Okay, so now Blavatsky and Olcott publish a circular letter uh, in a Boston-based spiritualist publication by the name of the Spiritual Scientist. And they named themselves the Brotherhood of Luxor. The Brother of Luxor. You kind of see a connection to the early Egyptian connection, right? So, soon uh, they began living together in a series of rented New York apartments funded uh, by all kind of course. Then they create what's called the Miracle Club. Miracle Club and they're joined by an Irish spiritualist by the name of William Quan Dutch, who now becomes like the third member of their group. Now arrives another mystery, and that is John King. John King is a, in this case, is a pure spirit in many ways. He's a pure spirit. He is like a ghost, but he's not a ghost. Uh, he's is earth haunting his habits? So he is a deceased person. So unlike these ascended masters that we're talking about, this is an actual spirit, right? Supposedly. He lived during the reign of Charles uh, II and was uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of a crazy kind of individual. He became a, a guardian angel in many ways for Blavatsky. And so what happens is, is that the this John King helps encourage Blavatsky as well as Alcock to form a, uh, a new group. And you'll see where we're going in a little bit. But Blavatsky says as follows about John King. He says, the spirit of John King is very fond of me, and I am fonder of him than of anything on earth. He is my only friend, my only friend. And I am indebted to any, and I am indebted to anyone for the radical change of my ideas of life, my strivings, and so on. It is to him alone. He has transformed me, and I shall be indebted to him when I go to the garret, for not having to dwell for whole centuries, it may be, in darkness and gloom. John and I are acquainted from old times, long before he began to materialize in London and take walk to the medium's house with a lamp in his hand. And so she talks about that. So so now um, he is described like an Apollyonist of Tiana. So this John King then becomes friends of the colonel. Okay, so, whoa. So, so now they're becoming friends. And John King supposedly then introduces the colonel to other masters, uh, four other masters. Uh, one, of course, is, I mean, one is, uh, not of course, one is the a Copt, he's a, he's a Coptic uh, gentleman, 
One is a Neoplatonist from the Alexandrian school. Uh, one is a, a master of masters. He's a Venetian. And finally, one is an English philosopher. And so Olcott is now being introduced uh, to these other masters. So uh, at first, uh, Olcott thought that John King was a disincarnate spirit. But then he believed that um, John, John King was actually four different kinds of spirits. And he was a, he had an independent personality. He was also a messenger. He was also a servant. And he was also an elemental spirit. So, uh, so he is, has four different forms. It gets even more complicated <clears throat> because John King uh, apparently then uh, connects them to another uh, uh, spiritual master by the name of Tutit Bey, uh, and uh, and so who sends a message to them through something called precipitation. Precipitation. And so the idea is, is this Tulpit Bay, the spiritual master, who is actually one who is a physical form, in this case, unlike the, the, the John, you know, the John King one, sends a message through precipitation. And what happens is this, is that you can, this is, this is better than email, or maybe it's just as good. Uh, but in those days, you send a letter, and of course, it's a very, you've heard of letters before, I don't know if you've heard of these. It, now then, you can check the mailbox. There could be one of those in there. But anyway, as opposed to sending a letter, what happened is that Toltec Bay would send it uh, in an ethereal sense, and it would drop out, uh, go through the air, and drop from the ceiling, and then down. And in this one, Toltec Bay writes a letter uh, to the colonel, encouraging him to treat Blavatsky in a wonderful way uh, and to treat her with respect uh, and, of course, reveals different mysteries uh, 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 to him. But also, he urges the creation of a brotherhood. Okay, so, so what happens is Blavatsky now needs to, you know, now this idea that we're going to have this brotherhood of Luxor what we're going to do is we're going to advertise it. So they advertise this for a little while. And meanwhile, they actually, uh, uh, there's this journal that's about to go broke. It's a, it's a spiritual journal uh, that's called Spiritual Scientist. And they volunteered to advertise their, their, their new brotherhood uh, of Luxor in this, in this particular uh, periodical. And so they finance them for a while. Uh, and uh, so that's good. But, it's, but, it's, but, it's, but the guy who had the magazine, who had the periodical, uh, he still kept losing money, and they finally gave up on that. Meanwhile, uh, another spiritual entity by the Serapis, uh, named Serapis, is writing the colonel. Well, then they form, uh, I told you about the Miracle Club. So at the Miracle Club, here we go, we're finally at the, I know it's, it's 931, but here we are. Finally, the creation of theosophy. I want to get into the creation of theosophy, talk a little bit about it, and talk about a little bit about Manifest and Lemuria and a few other things, and then we'll close up. But, uh, at a miracle meeting on September 7th, 1875, Blavatsky, Alcott, and Judge, they meet with a Charles Southern, and they have this speaker. The speaker, he at the Miracle Club, because the idea is going to hear, it would be like this, right? You know, you're the Miracle Club. And so the whole reason for the Miracle Club is to hear various speakers talk about the occult and mysteries and all sorts of things, just like you are doing right here. And this one speaker, uh, his name is Mr. Felt, spoke on the lost canon, a proportion of the Egyptians. He claimed he had discovered the magical formula that enabled the creation of the pyramids as well as the other mighty buildings in ancient Egypt. And of course, this formula has in it a square and within it a circle and within that another square and within that uh, three triangles and within that a five-sided figure. And, and then he talked about how this was used as a special measure as the canon of proportion. And um, one person in the audience uh, he happened to be a into the Kabbalah. Asked Mr. Felton if he could if he could uh, 
evoked spirits using this symbol. And Mr. Felt jumped up straight away and replied that he would certainly could. You could you could make apparitions appear with this particular uh, symbol. Well, this is kind of an exciting talk for the Miracle Club. And they're all talking afterwards, going on and on. And during this discussion, the colonel was thinking, we need to have a society that researches the occult, that investigates these kinds of mysteries that we just heard from the proper and good Mr. Felton. This idea. And uh, he's sitting there. He looked up Blavatsky. We could do this, you know? And Blavatsky kind of nodded her head. Yeah, maybe we should. And then he kind of hesitates for a few moments, you know, because he, he has to stand up in front of everybody. And finally, he makes his proclamation. They're going to form a group that will later on become the Theosophical Society. But he, he, there's no name yet. We should have a society that investigates the esoteric. They have a second meeting, and Mr. Felt is also there. And at their third meeting, they actually come up with the name. Mr. Southern, who is the, the fourth person who helped form the group, he found a word in the dictionary, theosophy. And he said, okay, well, Greek, theos, means God. Sophia means wisdom. Thus, it is God wisdom. It is divine wisdom. That's a perfect name. We are the divine wisdom society. So, Theosophical Society, making sense. And uh, this word theosophy was used by others, specifically used by Neoplatonists. So it was perfect. <clears throat> they formed not only a Theosophical Society, uh, they uh, decided uh, who's going to be in charge. Alcott, the colonel, was the chairman. The judge was the secretary. And Blavatsky was the corresponding secretary, although she was really in charge. But and they wanted to look at a large umbrella. They want to look at all kinds of different topics. They want to look at everything uh, from the Hindu sages to Platonism uh, to other her Hermeticism to uh, other es esoteric things. Uh, they saw themselves as continuing on from the legacy of the neo platonic uh, uh, philosophers of late antiquity. And so they came up with their three major ideas. Number one, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. By the way, that's really forward. I'm going to read it one more time. Very, very modern. To form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity, to be sisterhood though, without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. Okay, all inclusive. Number two, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science. Number three, to investigate the unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. So there you have it. So uh, so the society is formed. Blavatsky at this time calls herself uh, a, um, well, as a monotheistic uh, eminence and a mystical cosmologist, or she says, I'm basically a pantheist, right? So basically, that's his idea. She believed that there is a divine principle, which is the root of all, from which all proceeds, which all emanates, and within all shall be absorbed at the end of the great cycle. So all things emanate from the one, and eventually all those things shall return, right? Okay, so, so there you have it. Of course, what will happen uh, is they will investigate Western esotericism, but they will bring in They'll study also Eastern beliefs, and they'll bring in ideas of the vocabulary of Eastern beliefs and bring it together. Well, Blavatsky wants to uh, write something that will encompass all this. So she writes, of course, uh, the work known as The Veil of Isis. <laughs> At least that's the title she thought. It became Isis Unveiled because the publisher changed it. But anyway, this is, what she decided to do is bring all of these ideas from the West and the East together in this very long collection, which I have right here. So there's a collection, almost a thousand pages uh, worth of materials, which I did use for this talk. 
<laughs> so there you have it. Uh, and uh, she said that when she wrote this work, she felt like there's the second consciousness that was with her that inspired much of the writing. It wasn't just her, it was something else. You know, and if, if you've ever read this work, it's pretty amazing. I mean, sure, there's problems with it when it comes to scholarship. Yes, there are contradictions here and there. Yes, there are things that we now know as a science are not true, but there's other things that are truly amazing. And it reveals to me after reading this work that she is, she has a copious memory. Uh, she's brilliant. I mean, extremely intelligent. And she has a good way of putting ideas together. So she writes this work uh, and it is published. Although, um, at first, uh, she does not believe in re reincarnation. She's interested in it, but she doesn't put it into the book itself. And that will be put into her next book. Ice Ice and Veil uh, focuses on 10 points. And these points are, are first, number one, there is no miracle. Everything that happens is the result of law. But it's an eternal law. It's an immutable law. And it's also ever act affected. Number two. Nature is triune. There is a visible, objective nature, an invisible, indwelling, energizing nature, which is the exact model of the other, and its vital principle. And above these two spirits, uh, the sources of all forces, alone you have the eternal and the indestructible. So once again, you got the invisible uh, right there. Uh, you got the energizing nature. And then you have something that transcends both. So there it is. Uh, number three, uh, she says that humanity is also triune, right? So that humanity has three parts, a divine spark, an astral fluid, <clears throat> and a physical body. Once again, divine spark, astral fluid, and physical body. Fourth, magic as a science is the knowledge of these principles. Fifth, arcane knowledge. Misapplied is sorcery. Six, mediumship is the opposite of adeptship. The mediumship is the passive instru instrument of foreign influences. Seventh, all things that ever were, that are, or will be having uh, the record upon the astral light or tablet of the unseen universe can know all that has been known or can be known. So all knowledge is possible. Eight, races of men differ in spiritual gifts. Ninth, one uh, phase of magical skill is the voluntary and the conscious withdrawal of the inner man, astral form, from the outer man, physical body. And finally, 10th, the cornerstone of magic is an infinite, sorry, sorry, the intimate practical knowledge of magnetism and electricity, these qualities, correlations, and potencies. In fact, in many cases, she talks about the idea that, that what we know in a religious sense are also science so again i need to wrap up but i don't want to say a few other things let's just finish up where, where, where we're at so basically uh theosophical society is formed and what does she do uh she goes off uh, back to india where she hangs out what is called the arya samaj the arya samaj uh they're very much into indian nationalism and bringing uh indian spirituality to go uh, together. And which is interesting is that when she arrives, uh, you know, this Theosophical Society is very empathetic towards Hindus. And the Christian missionaries don't want her there. The English administration doesn't want her there. They see her as a spy. In fact, British intelligence tracks her down. You know, she's up to, up to no good because she is championing Indian religion under British rule and possibly connected to the politics. However, those in India love the Theosophical Society. So now you're having individuals, uh, many people who are non-Western uh, that uh, are, are part of this and joining uh, this society. And uh, then, of course, what happens in the end is that um, it becomes very big. We're almost done. But then there is a scandal. What happened is, is that Sir Emma Cologne and her husband, uh, they fell into poverty in Ceylon. 
and Blavatsky invited them to move into her home in Bombay. And, you know, she wanted to get a job, but they couldn't find a job. So she had them work for her. Well, here is the problem. The problem is, is that the, uh, she is going to leave for a little while. And because of that, they're going to cause a problem after she leaves. So let's tell you where she goes, and then I'll tell you what's going to happen. So what happens is that the, uh, she goes off, she has Bright's disease, and so she has to kind of, you know, in India, for her, is not as healthy. And um, she does, for a short period of time, she stays at a new estate at Adyar, but then, uh, and she goes to Tibet, but her health is deteriorating, and so accompanied by Alcott, we go back to Britain uh, during this period of time. He made contact with the Society of Psychical Research, uh, which is known as SPR, but uh, they didn't like her very well. They didn't like her at all. In fact, they're connected to also her downfall in many different ways. Uh, meanwhile, the Colognes, who are living in her place in Bombay, who are part of the Theosophical Society, what they are doing is they misappropriated the funds for their own purposes. And so they were found out and they're supposed to be thrown out. Well, that's he doesn't know at this time. It's supposed to be thrown out because they're, they're, they're stealing from the, the fund. And they say, well, if you throw us out, we're going to prove that Blavatsky is a fake, fake, that she's a fraud, that she's making things up. And they, they try to blackmail, they try to blackmail uh, those within the Theosophical Society in India, not, not, not to say anything and not to kick them out because they have something on Madame Blavatsky. Well, they kick, they, they kick them out anyway. And so what happens is that this couple then goes to the Madras based Christian College magazine and they publish uh, this article saying that Blavatsky's ideas are all fraudulent. Uh, she's a phony, she's a fake. Uh, and so this story becomes popular and spreads everywhere. Well, of course, Blavatsky is freaking out. She's pretty upset. Her health is going downhill uh, as it is. You know, and now you have this negative press going about. Well, uh, she settles in Naples, Italy in 1885, and she's, she lives off a small pension. She writes the next big book called The Secret Doctrine during this time, but she continues to be very ill. Then the SPR, remember that society I mentioned, uh, what they do is they pick up on these claims and these stories, and then they make it, they make the, the assertion. That, yeah, Blavatsky's a fraud and she's not true. And so Blavatsky's about to sue them, but Alcott, the colonel, says, don't do it, don't do it, because doing such things would only damage the society. I want to tell you something. The SBR published this. They ruined her career. They ruined her credibility. Whether you believe she's a child or not, it was just not a nice thing to do. Here's what happened. In 1986, the SBR admitted that they messed up on what they said about Blavatsky, and they officially retracted the findings of the report. But the report itself was made on hearsay. It had no strong support, and they were as guilty as what they were accusing Vladimir Blavatsky of. 1986, finally she was vindicated, but a little too late for her lifetime. Still, so many did believe in her and what she had to say. And so what happened is now she's in a wheelchair at this time. She moves to Belgium uh, and um, she gets money from a small ink producing business. And then what she does is she, she helps establish the Blavatsky Lodge uh, in, in London. A famous W.B. Yeats is a part of it. Yeats, excuse me, is a part of it. Uh, then she forms is called the Esoteric Section of the Theosophical Society for the True uh, Theosophists. Uh, and uh, then uh, she writes her secret doctrine. Uh, but I want to say, uh, this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish her life, and then I'll talk about secret doctrine, and then we're done. But 
I want to mention that uh, she was visited by Mahat Gandhi, uh, who was studying the Bhagavad Gita at this time. He became an associate member of Lovatsky's Lodge in March of 1891. Uh, Gandhi says uh, that she he was moved to her works, especially the key to theosophy, uh, amazed by it. Uh, in fact, he said that he follows her school, but not the school of Annie Besant or Lead Beater. But he does follow, he did see himself as part of theosophy, but only the man of Blavatsky kind. And he thought that she was a, a pretty amazing person. So that's good. So Gandhi wasn't scared off by all the hearsay or the various stories. But unfortunately, eventually, Madame Blavatsky uh, continues to deteriorate. Uh, and finally, um, uh, she um, uh, she dies on May 8th, 1891 uh, in Besant's house. And of course, Annie Besant then becomes the head of the uh, 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 of the Theosophical Society after her. Uh, and, there, and there you have it. So what she left with, but before she died, she wrote a few works, and the most important one uh, happened to be uh, the uh, the secret doctrine. This is this will be it. The secret doctrine. She talked about the fact uh, that the the primordial essence separated into seven rays, and these seven rays created the universe using an energy called full hot. These seven rays corresponded uh, to uh, the Greek alphabet. They're also known as the seven heavens. And these rays she had represented uh, through the spiritual masters that she met throughout her life. The first ray was Master Moya, and, and he's connected to the idea of unshakable strength. So that's what he helps guide people to believe. The second ray is Master Kuthumi. This is the ray of wisdom. The third ray is of the Venetian. Uh, and of course, this is uh, the idea of becoming a good, uh, being a, a, to, a, a, adaptable to various things, various situations, uh, being tactful, which is interesting. Fourth ray is Master Seraphis, connected with harmony and beauty. Uh, then, of course, the sixth, the fifth ray is Master Hilarion, uh, who is connected uh, to the idea of science observation. The sixth ray is Master Jesus, who is connected to the devotional saints and mystics of every religion. And the seventh ray is Saint Germain, who works to a large extent with ceremonial magic and employs the service of the great angels. She talked about that the earth went through seven rounds, and there are seven living creatures that were living during the seven ages. And they call them the root races. The first race that created the earth was created, or sorry, that existed. The first root one was called the imperishable sacred lamb. These were the first pilgrims of the first root race, and they lived during the time of the primordial liquid of the earth. Their bodies were etheric rather than organic, and they lived around the north and south poles. The second root race was a hyperboreans. They were, they were made out of pure spirit, but they, were, they also had watery bodies and were able to assume diverse and monstrous shapes as they experimented with the physical world. And they were also the ones that multiplied by division as well as the previous ones. So you have, in a sense, we're like an amoeba in many ways. The third uh, race lived in the continent of Lemuria. And Lemuria. And here, uh, they were a physical shape. They were humans, but the Lemurians were primitive, ruled by kings. They built massive and crude cities. They had exceptional psychic powers, and they believed in almost a monotheistic belief system. The next group were the Atlanteans. That's right. Those of Atlantis, they were next. They had physical bodies, psychic powers. Uh, she believed they could have been giants. Uh, they, uh, they mated with uh, she-animals, uh, gorillas and chimpanzees at times. 
uh, and they're when the when the when the continent sunk, uh, they uh, groups from their society went to Egypt. Others went uh, to the Americas, and so the Atlanteans themselves were of two races. One was a warrior race, and the other were a priestly meditative race. And so there you have it. Uh, in fact, she said that um, during this time, and perhaps earlier, there were all these subterranean passages uh, that were known by those who had special secret knowledge. And these, these passageways that go under the earth connect everything together. In fact, she says that there was possibly a passageway that went from India under the ocean to Atlantis. Uh, she mentions a few of the caves that were openings to these passageways in India, one at Elora, one at El Fanta, and one at the Ajunta Caverns. So she talks about that. She says, in fact, the word Atlantis uh, is she says it's not even Greek. She she claims, she says that uh, its roots have nothing connected to the, the Greek language, and that is true. But I, I know that the word Atlantis can connect to a Minoan and through the Mycenaeans. They don't know this at that time. But she makes a connection to the word Atlantis and Atlas uh, to the Toltec language because they have this very hard edge or aqua. Uh, in their language. She also says that the Lemurians and the, those of Atlantis when it comes to the continent may be the, exactly the same kind of place. The, the third root language uh, race was kind of controversial. Those are the Aryans or Indo-Europeans. Uh, and, uh, and they are the next group. The next group, finally, uh, the fifth group is the Maitreya. Uh, and then finally, the humanity uh, would develop uh, uh, from uh, this this root language, uh, the root groups finally, and then of course you have the seventh root language group and so forth and so on. Anyway, so what happens is uh, so the, the next race is yet to come. So we don't know where we're going to go from here, according to uh, uh, to Blavatsky. So the seventh is completely unknown as of yet. She also translated the Book of Dizion uh, from that mystical language that nobody can read. Uh, and then, of course, she wrote another work called The Voice of Silence. She actually wrote uh, quite a lot of it. So, Blavatsky is a controversial figure. So, so how do we look at her? I mean, some of the things I said tonight are pretty incredible. And I know that it's a challenge when it comes to a person's beliefs. But I want to be very careful because at the same time, you know, we can't fully know what is true and what is not fully though. I mean, I, I do see some inaccuracies within uh, the works when it comes to historical aspects. But remember, she is teaching a belief system. She is teaching a religious system. Uh, she is teaching a form of spirituality. And, um, and so, you know, the point of the matter is uh, she developed texts as followers, and she does bring together so much of Western esotericism together, as you saw. So much of what we know, not only of the occult in, in within the modern uh, world, but even moving into what is understood as the New Age movement starts with Madame Blavatsky. She is, whether you agree with her or not, Let's say it. She's extremely intelligent. She's extremely creative. Very, very creative. She has the command of different ideas, quite a bit of knowledge, and she knew how to market it, and she knew how to address others and to convince them to believe it. And she was an incredible woman. She was somebody that went to areas that were oftentimes not acceptable for Victorian women uh, to enter. You know, she went to places, saw people, and engaged in activities that, well, uh, Victorian women were not expected to do. So she is, she is breaking through when it comes to gender norms. That is a great contribution. It really is. 
At the same time, she was very well traveled. Uh, she learned so much about the world. She had a photographic memory. And so, we don't know. Because the thing is, the reality is, when we look at all different religions, if we look at the Hebrew Bible, and we read the stories of the prophets, and we go, ooh, this is, you know, many people believe that. Others don't. But we have to make sure that we don't judge them. Got it? We move into Christianity. We look at the New Testament and the miracles of Jesus, right? No, there are things that are happening, right? We don't, right? Are you guys, are you guys getting this, right? So we go to different religions, within Hinduism, Buddhism, a lot of the cornerstones are these acts, these miraculous acts that we say are magical or mystical or wherever they are, but they are there. They're doing something and it's evidential. And who are we to say that she didn't have something? extra that gave her an edge maybe she did have some spiritual powers maybe some of this is true maybe none of it's true but you know what i'll let you decide i'm not going to decide for you i'm going to let you decide whether or not madame blavatsky is is really having these experiences or you know she's making it all up or she's somewhere in the halfway house in between but at the same time, we have to be very respectful because the Theosophical Society is alive and well today. And many people uh, practice this belief system, or I should say, not belief system, but, but the canopy. I'll be corrected very quickly, right? The Theosophical Society investigates all these areas, which is, is a gigantic umbrella that encompasses many different beliefs. I want to mention that in India, did you know that Madame Blavatsky and the colonel had themselves um, uh, converted over to Buddhism? Actually, this happened, happened in Ceylon. They converted over officially to Buddhism. And yet, you know, the Theosophical Society is open to all these different belief systems, whether you're pagan, whether you're, whether you're Christian, whether you're Jewish, uh, whether you're Hindu, whether you're Buddhist, whatever you are, it's open, but it's but it looks into the esoteric. It looks into the arcane. It looks into the mysterious. It looks into the magic. It looks into the mystical. And you know what? Maybe we need a little bit more magic and mystery in our lives. Maybe we, maybe, maybe we do. And I got to tell you, pick up a book by Madame Blavatsky. I guarantee it, whether you believe it or not, you will be properly entertained. It will night your imagination. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> A lot of information. A lot of information. I'm echoing. It's not an echo. It's not an echo. 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 Okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> okay, any, any questions? Did you guys enjoy the talk? You learned some things about Blavatsky? Yes, very much. Yeah. So any thoughts, right? I think it's amazing how she she connects to so many different um, groups throughout her. You, know, you can almost draw a, a a tree of all the different uh, uh you know um, lodges and fraternal orders and esoteric orders and gandhi her. for heaven's sakes huh gandhi i mean gandhi liked her and joined her lodge yeah in 1891 yeah loved her thought she's great read her read uh, ice is unveiled yeah. <laughs> so he got through it so yeah. you know so yeah and, and you, you heard the list of people who, who thought she was wonderful. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, when she left for New York, a guy by the name of Thomas Edison chased after her to give her one of her one of his inventions. You know, it's like, this is this pretty amazing stuff, you know? So, I mean, he, you know, so she was definitely beloved by quite a few very important uh, figures, uh, true shakers and makers of history. I mean, you take a look at this list. I mean, 
as I said, look at you got the Thomas Edison, P.S. Eliot, Robert Duncan, Lewis Carroll, Carl Jung, uh, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, Jack London, um, Jean Sibelius, you know, Thornton Wilder, even Forrester. Uh, you know, I mean, you look at this list, you just, you're just amazed. It's amazing just to, just to think of all these people who thought were inspired by her. And if anything, I should have added that um, they were inspired by her. I mean, they loved her stuff. It helped their creative abilities. And isn't that also another benefit? Mm -hmm. Whether or not you believe what she said, what she stirred up. And she also stirred up the idea that, you know, science and spirituality could be two sides of one, one point. She got to the point where she believed in that so much that her first volume of Ice is Unveiled is called Science. And her second volume is called Theology. So she literally is seeing these, and I think that some of these inventors and thinkers are going, you know, maybe it's two sides to one point. Uh, other people uh, looked up to her, of course, you know, Aleister Crawley. <laughs> you know, Alistair was inspired uh, by, uh, you know, by what she, what she had to had to say. Uh, yeah, Jack says, fascinating woman with such intriguing ideas. Whether you believe them or not, her writing sparked so many different ideas. Yeah, they really did. And um, and I th maybe she has the gift of creativity. I always think back when she was a little girl. I thought I was there. I'm not one of the adepts. You know, Visiting her, you know, and it's like, it's like, but, 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 uh, but I recollect talking about it. I'm going to watch myself there. I recollect that the, she loved telling stories. As a little girl, she was a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And she, and that's what she did. And I think that she was a storyteller all the way to the end of her life. Now, how much of those stories were true or not? Mm -hmm. But they were good stories. You notice all the authors that love her. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned a whole litany list of, of authors that thought, hey, this, you know, and uh, of course they like her because uh, she does inspire uh, different perspectives. In fact, what happened is when you, when you, read, when you read her work, Isis and Veil, what I think is fun, uh, I recommend reading both, is that she goes on so many different topics. She goes in, she talks a lot about ancient Greeks and the, and the Romans and philosophies and uh, he talks about Tibetan uh, mystics um, you know and, and secret communication systems and all this cool stuff you know some of her ideas uh, and what she talks about uh, do leak into some of their writings and they go somewhere else I should have mentioned this her writings inspire uh, the pulp novelists who connect to ancient ideas with their novels and um and so these pulp novelists will incorporate incorporate many of her ideas into their stories during the 19 teens and to the 1920s and 1930s and mix that with new ideas of the horror genre and mix that with ideas of science fiction also connected to that thread of thought so that's another one, <laughs> yeah. So, so she, so the idea of underground tunnels too. That idea spreads. Right now, we're experiencing that idea as the reptilians, <laughs> right? Seriously, this is you know the underground Earth. She's one of the first first ones to talk about the hollow Earth theory, uh, and then it goes into these other other connections. She's a big advocate for the idea of Atlantis, uh, that becomes very popular. Uh, even though it existed with Plato and so forth, I'm talking about putting the new age spin on it. That was Madame Blavatsky. The Lemurian stories, that's her, right? That's a lot of her, her ideas inspired that um, and uh, spread to uh, late 19th century and especially early 20th century writers and thinkers. And, and so you're going to have these novels, stories of Atlantis and Lemuria. That's her too. So what a gift. So I think the world's a little better for her as opposed to not. Any other any other questions or any questions? Right. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight. 
I did. Yep. And I guess I will, will close it up. Okay.